already. Well, good morning, everyone. Please join us in worshiping our Lord. Let's stand, sing together. We're going to sing Everlasting God. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. God, you reign forever, our hope, our strong deliverer, you are the everlasting God, the everlasting God, you do not thank you. Good morning, everyone. So glad that you are joining in with us today. Um, I have several announcements for you, and today is a fun day because today is our first day of our Advent preparation and celebration, and so we will be lighting the first candle of Advent this morning. First, let me share with you a few announcements. Um, and there is a range of them. One of them is for our ladies. Those of you who are ladies, you can grab one of these flyers at the information table if you're here on the way out. Um, the, the ladies from our sister church, our Wichita Avenue Church, have invited any of you who would like to participate um, to be a part of an ornament exchange. And so they're going to be meeting on Saturday, December 11th. At the, um, at the Clackamas um, uh, Olive Garden, um, at the Clackamas Promenade. And so there's more details on that flyer that you can grab, or if you want to. Oh, I'm told that there's been an update, and they're changing the location to the old spaghetti factory in, in Clackamas instead. So 
Um, you can get that information on your way out, or you can call and we'll give you some update. Okay. So um, you can get some more details on that. Other things that are taking place, um, we are getting ready to do uh, food boxes for Christmas. So we weren't able to prepare them before Thanksgiving, but we are gearing up to do them for Christmas. Um, if you would like to be a part of that and help in some way, please let Bart Caprine know, um, and he can give you some details. We'll have some more information and the sign-up flyers coming out very soon here. Want to let you know that our annual congregational meeting is coming up just after the turn of the year. So start making note of that. On January 16th, we'll be meeting prior to the regular morning service. So we'll be meeting at 9.15 a.m. Um, I believe that will also be uh, available to see um, via Facebook that morning, um, our, our regular live streaming. Unfortunately, that's not able to be interactive. You're not able to vote through that way. Um, but if you would like to see the information and you haven't been joining us in person, you can do so there. Otherwise, please make note and plan to be here early that Sunday morning on January 16th. Also, we are planning to have our regular um, Christmas Eve candlelight service this year. So things were very different last year and we weren't able to do it the same way, but we are planning to hold it this year. And so if that's a special time thing for you and your family, um, please make note of that. It'll be at five o'clock on, on the 24th on Christmas Eve. And I believe we will also be um, uh, uh, doing that through live stream as well. So you can plan to participate in that way. Okay, those are the announcements that I have. So at this time, I'm gonna invite um, for our candle lighting this morning, um, Deanna Schmidt is going to come and read our first reading and light the first candle of Advent, and then we'll have a time of prayer together. So Deanna. Good morning, everyone. I hope you have a, thing, a nice Thanksgiving. <clears throat> the first candle that I'm going to light today is, for, is the prophecy candle or the candle of hope. We can hope because God is faithful and will keep the promises made to us. Our hope comes from God. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise or rule over the nations. The Gentiles will hope in him. May the God of hope fill you and all, and all hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, 12, and 13. This is the candle of hope. Very good. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and grace. Thank you for the joy of remembrance and this time that we set aside to um, reflect on and remember your coming into the world in the fullness of time as, um, as that child, but also as our Savior and our Lord. And we look forward to you, your return as the conquering king, the great prince of heaven, coming to claim your bride, your church, to be your own for all eternity. Lord, may we live in such a way to personally prepare, to uh, set aside sin and, and uh, repent of it, that it might be removed from our lives and we might live in pure um, a relationship with you. And may we live in such a way as to be your testimonies to the world, you, the evidence that you truly are the righteous king who can cleanse from sin. Lord, may the world see us 
and recognize you and your handiwork in us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. May you be the centerpiece. May you be the bright morning star of our worship, of our adoration, of our praise this morning. Truly, you and you alone are worthy of all of our praise. We love you, Lord God. In your name, amen. Let's worship in song together. Please stand once again. We're going to sing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus.
these things shall be added unto you. Nathan's sermon today is titled, He's Got the Whole World in His Hands, so I feel like we have to do this song. He's got the whole world in His hands, He's got the whole world in His hands, He's got the whole world in His hands, He's got the whole world in His hands. He's got you and me, brother. got a you and me sister in his hands he's got you and me sister in his hands he's got you and me sister in his hands he's got the whole world in his hands he's got the itty bitty baby in his hands he's got the itty bitty baby in his hands he's got the itty bitty baby in his hands got the whole world in his hands. He's got everybody here in his hands. He's got everybody here in his hands. He's got everybody here in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world be seated. Pastor Nathan. Good morning again, and happy Thanksgiving a little bit late. I hope that uh, if you were celebrating Thanksgiving that you had a lovely time um, in the way that you chose to celebrate. This morning's message uh, is is continuing in our series. I didn't I didn't step out of our series to do this um, that we've been walking through. Although you'll notice that there aren't any passages out of Genesis, and it's not yet step, stepping into Exodus. Um, so we're it's not continuing chronologically this morning, but rather we want to capture a core principle. And if on Thursday you would have asked me the traditional American Thanksgiving question of what is it that you're thankful for this year? I believe that this morning's message captures the heart of what my answer would have been, which is what I'm most thankful for is the truth that God has this all together in his hands. He is still sovereign. He is still Lord. He is in control of all things in the sense that all things answer to him. So we want to take a, a look at that big picture this morning. And so, as Vic already said, um, I wasn't particularly creative this week. I just borrowed the title from this popular song. He's got the whole world in his hand. If you want to think theologically, we're speaking of the doctrine of providence this morning. The idea that all things answer to God's sovereign rule. Nothing escapes his omniscience, his awareness. And he is working sometimes in ways that we see plainly and experience plainly, and sometimes in ways that are mysterious and veiled and hidden to us that we may not see immediately, we may not see even longer term, we may not see at all within our lifetime, but God has a way of weaving things together 
for his ultimate purposes and the good of his entire redemptive plan. We're going to take um, a little bit of sampling this morning. Uh, you've gotten used to doing that these last couple of weeks. We're going to do that again um, this week. We're going to take um, uh, some samplings through Scripture, so a, a wider, wider range jumping back and forth than we have before. So two out of the New Testament and one jumping all the way back into Psalms. So they're up there right now if you want to prepare, um, but also they'll be... Um, on each, each slide for each point. I want to walk through three main supporting ideas with you this morning, and they're all captured in this language of the hand of God, the hand representing his strength, his power, his movement on our behalf and on behalf of the world and his plan. So those three big ideas are going to be that the Lord's hand holds together all of creation. So the very substance of creation itself, he's holding together. Secondly, the Lord's hand rules over all things in righteousness. He is a righteous king and ruler. And finally, we want to take a look at the Lord's hand provides what we need. He is personal to you and I, his people, and he provides our needs. We can trust him to be a good provider. Well, here's an overview way of looking at it. The big idea here, I called it. The Lord, through his providential work in creation, holds all things together, rules over all, and provides all that is needed. We can trust the righteousness of his will and his way. Amen? Let's dive into it. We're going to start in the book of Colossians. Would you take a look at Colossians 1 with me? And in this vein of sampling, we're just going to look at a few verses. Verses 15 through 17 here in Colossians chapter 1. We read this. He, and he here is Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens... And on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So again, that, that first major point, um, the Lord's hand holds together all of creation. Now, let's take a look at a few things here and, and see if you can track with me. Out of verse 15, there is, um, it's worded in a certain way here, but it's a theme that runs um, through much of the New Testament, especially in the Pauline epistle teachings about Jesus, uh, this idea of the eternality of Jesus, that Jesus is one with the Father from the very beginning. Of course, we classically look at the beginning of the book of John, where John so beautifully and poetically looks back into the eternity past and recognizes Jesus as the Word there with the Father, that he was with the Father and he is one with the Father, that he was with God and indeed is God. Jesus and the Father are eternally one from the very beginning. Here we have, um, he is the 
image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. This idea of firstborn is, is denoting the peculiarity that Jesus came in the fullness of time in flesh. In that sense, he becomes identified with creation because he takes on a created, real, physical body. And yet, where does he trace his beginnings to? There is no beginning, right? He is eternal with the Father. He has always been. And so there's there's this kind of play on words almost, this interesting idea that he is the firstborn of creation. He came before all of creation. In fact, we're going to see he has his own hands, his fingerprints, his creative power in the creation process itself. We also see that he is... Um, one with the Father, that he is eternal, and we're told here that he is the image of the invisible God. We've mentioned this many times in this church setting, in our, in our family presence here, and so I'm going to try to drum it in one more time. When we look upon Jesus Christ in the pages of Scripture, in the annals of history, when we see what he says, what he does, the attitudes that he portrays, the actions that he chooses, we are seeing the very likeness, the fullness, the full presence of God himself. They are one. And so when we have the privilege to look upon Jesus, to read about what he's done and what he says, what he teaches, how he instructs, there's no hiddenness. There's no second agenda. Jesus himself went out of his way to teach the disciples by saying, I haven't told you anything that the Father hasn't told me to tell you. There's nothing hidden from you. There's nothing um, secretive. There's no, there's, no, um, uh, uh, there's no difference of agenda or perspective. When we look upon Jesus, we see the fullness of God. They're eternally one. Out of verse 16... Jesus is intimately involved in all creation and exists to serve him. He is there in the beginning. We, we, um, in Genesis 1, uh, we see the, the Spirit of God hovering on the, over the unformedness of the deep, uh, the darkness, and we hear the word of God being proclaimed and creation coming into being. Jesus, the fullness of God, is there in the beginning, active in creation. Jesus is present from the very, very beginning. We're told here in this passage, we're getting, we get this glimpse, that all things have been created not only through him, but also for him. The purpose of creation is to serve God. It exists for, for Jesus. It exists for his good pleasure, for his will. He loves what he has created. He's done so by choice, and he chooses to interact, to reveal himself, to make known, to embrace and draw near. And ultimately, our story that we look at is he also redeems back that which has been lost and broken and marred because of his deep love. It exists to serve him. Some of us wonder in our lostness, and I know I'm, I'm speaking to a room of people who have primarily um, found or been found by Jesus. But I don't know who might be listening in or who is completely here in the audience. In our lostness, we have an internal sense of 
there's got to be something more. And not just in a selfish sense of I want more stuff, but an understanding of, of innate purpose, that we need to have a purpose, that we've been created with some reason, some um, value. Scripture affirms that and says, yes, you have been created on purpose. You're not an accident. You're not a happenstance. But rather there is a God who is eternally chosen to love you and planned from the very beginning that you uniquely would be his and would serve him and would love him and be loved by him. Creation exists to serve him. Ultimately, I'm saying this based on verse 17, Jesus is Lord and sustainer of all creation. If you want to get really philosophical, um, I've shared this primarily with teenagers um, and my own children. It's an interesting uh, food for thought to contemplate. God actively sustains and holds together all creation. If that statement is true, and I believe that it is, then the mere fact that you are present and existing means the in eternal God of the universe is mindful of. He is thinking about you actively because you exist. It's an interesting idea to contemplate. He is ongoingly, actively sustaining all things, including and especially you and I. It's a beautiful thing. Okay, I'm going to keep moving here. Turn with me over to truly a poetic approach. We're going to turn over to the Psalms for a moment. We're going to get a little sampling out of the Psalms. It's a Davidic Psalm written by David, where he gives some of uh, his um, contemplations, his uh, meditation over, over the Lord and his providence. And so we're looking here at the Lord's hand rules over all in righteousness. From verse 15, verse 15 through 19 of Psalm 103, says, As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind has passed over it, it is no more. And, is placed, and its place acknowledges it no longer. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. On those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. To those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts to do them. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. Here, way back in the Psalms, we see David, the king, acknowledging the sovereignty of God. Let's take just a quick look at it. Um, I've summarized it in this way. In the first couple of verses, we get this, this poetry of speaking of the, the fragility, the finiteness of humanity. And, and I draw from that this picture of the flower that exists and is beautiful, but it only lasts a short time. And when its time is done, it's, it's gone away and its place is forgotten. I love that here the psalmist shows us God recognizes, he is aware of our frailty. He, he knows <laughs> Our weakness, I suppose I could say that even spiritually, he knows our weakness. Uh, but he knows that we uh, are not powerful like him. 
This is going to come back in our next passage as well. Uh, We don't have the ability to sustain ourselves. And he rules over us with love and compassion. He understands us. He understands who we are. He understands our sinfulness. He understands our need for him in our very existence, but also in our spiritual eternal existence that apart from his intervention, apart from his grace, apart from him redeeming us back, we will truly be lost. Our value, our place will be no more. So he rules, but he rules with love and compassion. That word compassion is interesting. I I heard a thing on the radio about this the other day that brought this to mind. Love is... um, The idea of love is the the choice to value someone, to to, um, lift them up, to, to esteem them, to care for them, to even give of one's self for the good, the benefit of another. Compassion takes love And the way I heard it the other day is compassion is love with work clothes on. The idea of now taking this choice, this sentiment, this belief, this valuing of a person, and this willingness to give of oneself and actually getting dirty with it going out, doing real things that actually benefit the other person. That's compassion. And God loves us and sacrifices of himself. The perfect picture of that is Jesus Christ himself on the cross and rising again. But he is continually active on our part. He is continually expressing love towards us. He's really doing good. Scripture describes it that indeed God is working all things together for the good of those who love him. Yes? What is he doing there? He, he, is, he has a big picture plan that will not be shaken of redemption. Right? His big plan for the world. And this is going to take place. Nothing is going to deter or keep God from that. And within that, God is personal enough to be mindful of who you are, what your strengths and weaknesses are, what your choices are, and to make room for you to have a place within his big picture plan for you to have the freedom of real choices and to fit in to his desire. He is working and weaving things together, not only for the big picture, but also for your benefit. Ultimately, that you would benefit by choosing to love and obey him and submitting your life and eternal life to him. But also in small ways. All of us would have testimonies of ways that we can point to where God has been gracious and kind, has given to us, has benefited us, has taught us, has protected us in ways um, that matter to us. My favorite of those... Well, i got to be careful with choosing favorites. I commonly experience things that I put in the category of there's no way I could prove them to somebody else. They would be silly to bring up an average conversation. i got no proof, right? It's the type of things that it could be, right, from an outside perspective. It could be just things of your imagination, But there is that testimony of the Holy Spirit that between you and God, 
you know that it was a personal kindness. And especially for me, oftentimes they are the difference between good attitude and bad attitude. And God's using them as a lesson in the moment, not just some meaningless act of kindness. I don't know if I suspect we experience those. All of us do. I can't speak as to your testimony. But I love that God is working things together, that he's mindful. Sometimes, and in Scripture, we see that playing out on the big, important scale. But a lot of times we forget that there was a whole lot of people that aren't mentioned in the pages of Scripture. God loved them, too, was mindful of them, aware of them. Many of them may have been humble believers who didn't make the pages of Scripture, and yet their lives mattered because of obedience to the Lord. Certainly, even within Scripture, we see people who are mentioned just for a moment, just for what might seem like a small thing to us, or even a mistake, and yet it gets referred back to later on by God as something of faith, something as an example. Okay, I'm, I'm really having fun there for a bit. Uh, the last verse here is pretty important, so let's get to that. God's dominion has no boundaries. Now, I'm taking, I'm taking a little bit of license here and really uh, cross-referencing or thinking about other passages as well, the fullness of the teaching of Scripture, not only what is said in this specific verse. But our specific verse talks about that the Lord has established his kingdom in heaven. Heaven being that picture of ultimate rule, dominion over all things. And it's backed up by the last part of the verse where it says, His sovereignty rules over what? Over all. The, the picture here is the ultimate God in the ultimate throne with all ultimate power over all things. What's that depicting? It's depicting a king whose kingdom or dominion, the, 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 the length, the boundaries of his reign know no ends. Over all things. The psalmist in another passage tells us that where can I go to hide from God? Uh, no, no depths or heights. N you know, there's no place left. No darkness dark enough. There's nowhere I can go to hide from the hand of God. And I suppose that there's two ways to look at that, right? For the one who has chosen to draw near as the child of God, there's no sweeter truth in the world. Nothing can keep me away from God. Nothing can hide me from him. Nothing can snatch me from his hand. He is present. He is aware. He knows everything about me. He's got it under control. And I suppose for the one who's living in rebellion and looking for a place to hide, there can be nothing scarier. My own children at times who wrestle with their own obedience from time to time have said, that's kind of creepy to use modern language. There's someone watching me all the time. He knows everything. He knows where I am. He knows my thoughts. Yeah, Santa Claus stole a page here. Uh, this didn't originate with good old Saint Nick. No, God is aware of all things, nothing escapes his sovereign hand. Well, let's keep moving. Turn with me, if you would, to our last passage, right in the middle between these two that we've looked at, in the book of Matthew. We're going to look at the, um, the last part of Matthew chapter 6, which is right square in the middle of what we refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6. Verses 25 through 34, 
And a lot of you, that will be its own section in how it's broken out in your Bible. I have a section heading that's been added in there called the cure for anxiety. Um, That sounds really, really good. Uh, I suspect that this is more of a charge to not be anxious because of recognizing who God is than it is so much a prescriptive cure for anxiety as if somehow that temptation or that, um, that sensation, that feeling will never come back again. But let's take a look at these verses for a moment and see what it has to say about God's providential hand at work. We're going to see that the Lord's hand provides what we need. So let's look at how Jesus described the providing for our needs. It says, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns. And yet, your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is a powerful passage. And it, um, boy, we, um, we ask some difficult questions of this passage as we go along, I suppose. Um, of <laughs> how, how does Jesus get off saying that? Hasn't he observed this situation or that situation? And isn't he aware of poverty and that poverty is a real thing? Isn't he aware of cruelty and how people have oppressed one another and hurt one another and, and um, taken away access to, to things? Yes, yes, certainly the eternal Jesus is very aware of those things. So what is he trying to get across here? What is he showing us about God? In the first, um, I'm going to kind of go back and overlap some points here. Um, In the first several verses, 25 through 29 there, um, we have the, the opening word pictures And and this charge not to be worried, not to be anxious is another good word here. Uh, Because of the normal, tangible things of life, the basic necessities, food, clothing, right? The things that, that we believe we need just to get by. And the point that I would try to make here is he's saying don't worry. God knows your needs and is a faithful provider. The first idea here is he is aware. 
The word picture here is not aimed at don't do any work, don't make wise decisions, don't prepare, don't use money. That's somehow a bad thing. Some people have, have kind of gone off the deep end and, and offered some strange interpretations here of, okay, this means that people shouldn't work. That wouldn't fit with the rest of Scripture. That would contradict other teachings that we have that specifically speak to the virtue and the value of being a hard worker. God sets that precedence in the very beginning in the garden where one of the very first things he does with Adam is give him work to do. And then he describes Adam and Eve and their place, their role in the whole world as having the job of overseeing, managing, and subduing, meaning putting into some sort of order and, and instruction the whole of the world. So it wouldn't fit for God to say, now don't do anything and you'll just be fine. That's not, that's not the core teaching. What he does do is he gives this interesting picture of the birds and the, the flowers. And he's saying, okay, God is aware of these things, specifically in context to the birds. He says, God is aware of the sparrows, the little birds, right? And they don't save up for the winter, so to speak. They don't have barns or these kinds of things. God takes care of them. He understands their nature and he provides for them. It doesn't have to be a thing of stress, the focus being on anxiety here. Uh, likewise, he talks about um, uh, God has this ability to adorn, to provide beauty for things, uh, like the lilies of the field, the, the beautiful wildflowers. And, and he likens that to Solomon. Solomon, the wealthiest king ever, right? Who, who had uh, access to anything he wanted. If we were to go back to the book of Ecclesiastes, um, Solomon himself describes how for a period of time as an experiment to understand the world, he used his position as king and his power, authority, and money to deny himself nothing. He was the ultimate hedonist doing anything and everything he wanted, buying anything he wanted. And you remember what Solomon's conclusion was at the end? Vanity. It amounts to nothing ultimately, nothing lasting, nothing eternally fulfilling. And Jesus is saying, even Solomon, in all of his splendor and all of his power and all of his majesty and all of his fancy clothes couldn't hold a candle to the beauty that God can do when he wants to just by speaking things into existence. He uses these pictures and more to get across this idea, God knows you, he understands you, he gets where you're at and what you need, and he has full ability to provide. I'm going to say something a bit uncomfortable, and you'll have to weigh it because it is not the scripture itself. If we find ourselves in true need of the necessities of life, point one, hold on, don't lose faith because you can trust God. Point two, take a good, hard, honest look at why are those necessities missing. They're probably, and I'm going to say it harder, I promise you they are not because God failed. He has been faithful. He has provided. We sometimes have trouble recognizing and accepting that provision. Okay. I'll get off my soapbox for a moment. Don't worry. Moving on to the second part here. 
he asks a provocative question. Oh, and I apologize if I didn't get the, the verse back up there. Let's see if we can find it real quick. Um, uh, verse 27 there. He asks a provocative question. I'll read it one more time. It says, who of you being worried can add a single hour to his life? And, and I broadened it out up here in my notes for myself, and, and, and maybe it's helpful to you. It's a question of, do you really have the power to take care of yourself better than God takes care of you? Right? Okay, I appreciate those of you who have an easy answer there, and I suspect that's coming because you've done some work with God. But that is the temptation of the heart, whether we thought through it and made an intentional, conscious decision or not. It is what our behavior gives away as our heart's foundation when we say, ah, no, God, I, I'm, I'm going to take back control. <laughs> I'm going to make the choices here. I'm going to decide which direction to go, what to do, right? What are we doing? All the time when we engage in selfishness, we put ourselves in the position of God in our lives. We put, set ourselves up as Lord, the one who is in charge. Think of, I'm going to get myself in trouble. Think of the conversations of the day and how many of them are centered around our sense of personal rights, and I know that's a touchy area, and how often the conclusion comes to nobody can tell each individual what to do because they're the Lord and master of their lives. There's a certain way that that is true sociologically, but is true find, primarily founded on a premise of a world of a universe where God does not exist. Just like most of our stories today coming out as movies and televisions offer us a fictional world that assumes God is not in the picture. Likewise, when we think about ourselves and we say, the buck stops with me, it is true in the sense of personal responsibility. I've got to make choices in my life as to my actions, but really, truly, in the real world, in what God has revealed to us, even that is only okay, it is only righteous, it is only pure, when it is held captive to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, it's right there with Solomon. It's vanity. It's emptiness. It won't lead you where you need to go. It won't provide for you. It won't protect you. The truth is, we are not great kings. We're not designed to be. You know what we are? We're great children. We're great servants. We're great worshipers. Because that's who we're designed to be. That's where we find our fulfillment. That's where we find our purpose and our place is in the loving, ruling arms of God. So question yourself, like Jesus asks us here. Are you really in a position to do a better job of taking care of you than God? If you just had access to all the world's provisions, would you really care for yourself in a way that benefits your soul? Or would it just benefit your desires? He's offering to us this idea that God sees a bigger picture and is a provider to a depth that goes beyond what we would even consider for ourselves. He's not only a provider of your day-to-day -day basic needs, he is the provider for your soul 
and your eternal life. Let's keep going. Verse 26, B, 30, B, and 32. There's several places here in a row that kind of give a, a reference to this. Um, let, me, let me look at those again a, real quickly because um, it's just these short portions. Uh, let me find it. 26, B. Um, he asked the question at the end of 26. Are you not... Are you not much more, are you, sorry, are you not worth much more than they? Um, referring back to the birds of the air. Um, in verse 30b, he says, find it here. Um, he, will he not much more clothe you? referring back to the fields and the, the things that are just going to get burned up when they're all done. And in verse 32, he says, for the, uh, for the Gentiles eagerly seek all this stuff. Then he says, for your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. I'm packaging all of this together and saying, God values and cares for you. This idea of his awareness. He isn't just generically aware just because you're a human being. That's true. But he also personally is aware. He values you. Let me say it a different way. <laughs> it's Christmas time leading up to it. And I don't know everybody's traditions, so I'm going to aim at some Americanized stereotypes, okay? Not, not saying this is directly you and your family. God is not bombarded by our Christmas wish lists and somehow feeling guilty and obligated. And so he tries his best to work out as much of your wish list as he can so that you'll like him, so that you'll trade a good gift with him, so you'll come into his house and spend some time with him. God is not guilt-tripped. He's not obligated to take care of us. He isn't bound by some celestial law that says, God, you can't be God anymore if you don't take care of everybody and aren't fair. There's no such thing. So why does God show grace? Why does he provide? Why can Scripture say that the sun rises and the rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous alike? He has chosen to make us in his image. That is a deep, mysterious thing that you can spend a lot of time unpacking the idea of. Something about that results in he values you and I. He wants to provide. He wants to. And beyond that, we see that he covenants with his people. Meaning, in some areas, God makes promises that he says, I am going to do no matter what even if you screw up. He's a good father. He is a good provider. Why? Because he has chosen to value you and care for you. Verse 33, I put it this way. Put God first and he will take care of you. It's a well-known passage. It's, a, it's been made into beautiful songs where we read, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all this stuff that you're worried about, all these basic things that you think are so important, so, uh, such a necessity, he will provide. Okay, let's, let me break that down a little bit. 
Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. His kingdom. What is a kingdom? A kingdom is everything that a king has dominion over. Right? Particularly what distinguishes God's kingdom is that which is submitted to him and his rule. I think what he's getting at here is <laughs> that which looks like, smells like, tastes like, feels like, that which has taken on the character of God and his likeness, that which God has dominion over. What are we talking about? The values, the purposes, the character of God, these are to be pursued by us. We're to put these things first. We're to seek after them. In Philippians, many of you are familiar with Philippians 4.8. Uh, I should be able to quote it right now, and I'm not being able to. Where, the, where Paul talks about in that, in that letter to the Philippians of what we put our minds towards. That we should be focusing on things that are pure and wholesome and of good reputation, right? He's getting at this idea of disciplining ourselves and our minds to purpose ourselves after the things of God. Here as well in Matthew, uh, in, the, in the Sermon on the Mount, God talks about our, he uses the language of treasure to represent what we value, what we go after, what we strive after. And he talks about building up treasure that is eternally lasting. Well, that isn't very many things. It, it certainly is not just the physical matter that is bound to and of this earth. It isn't our gold. It isn't our promissory notes from the treasury. Those things are not eternal. They're not lasting. They don't endure. The things that are lasting are the character of God itself, is the people of God that he has created. Uh, he talks about attitudes like faith, hope, and love, and he says, and the greatest of these is love. Why? Because love is eternally going to be necessary and present with us for all time. Seek first his kingdom, his rule, and his righteousness, his way of doing things. Righteousness has to do with actions, our real obedience, behaving in likeness with what God has taught or revealed about himself. Living in a way that is consistent with his character and his values. So seek first God's kingdom, what he's in charge of, and then live it out. Do something about it. Live in a way that is consistent with who God is. Can I make it in, in a little easier fashion, perhaps? I think what Jesus is getting at here is God's going to take the time to reveal himself to make himself known and seen and understood. Grab hold of that and go after it wholeheartedly. And what he makes a commitment to is if you will seek after God first, he will honor that and be with you in all things in all ways, and he'll take care of you in the deepest understanding of that word. Notice there's no silly, whimsical, self-centered commitments here. This is not, if you'll do this, then God will make you rich and powerful. There's none of this wishy-washy, surface-level, American Idol-esque garbage on the top. He's saying God will 
totally take care of the whole of who you are. Yes, he has already shown us a comfort for the basic necessities of life. But he's getting deeper than that. He's getting down to our need to be released from sin. Our need to be changed and transformed and to look more like him. Our need for an eternal home with him that we're adopted into his family as children and, and he makes a bedroom for us. He makes an intimate place in his household just for us to be with him. He makes a place for us in his family and gives us a community and people who are not perfect people. You ever hung around with your family? A lot of perfection there? No, that's not what we're going for. He gives us a place with a people who are like us in the sense of his spirit is in them and working in them and alive and, and animating who they are. All of this and more. He cares about the depths of providing for you. Put God first and he will take care of you. Okay, why do I take so much time to say it that way? We live in a, sh in a time where once again we are looking back to the past for some wisdom. And if you do that, you'll notice that God has had followers in the kingdoms of the world, remnant believers, who have undergone difficult terrible times in the physical sense, in the flesh. Times of starvation and depravity, or de deprivation. <laughs> uh, depravity as well uh, goes along with it. Uh, times of persecution. Prolonged times of not being able to see how does this all fit, God? Uh, what is our specific place in your story? Because sometimes we can't see that. All we can see is the bigger picture story that God has a plan of redemption and he says to trust him and he says to seek him first and he says to continue being like him in character even if we don't get a sense of relief in the circumstances right now. And if we're really just brass tacks honest this morning about world history, we see that sometimes God allows real, believing, honest, sincere people to even go to the grave in difficult circumstances. Whether that be with the glory of martyrdom or with that, whether it be the untold, unseen stories of faithfulness that we won't know till we get to heaven. So this is not a lesson that says, if you'll just believe God and, and accept him and go to church and be a good person, that somehow you'll never get sick and you won't have to worry about paying your bills and you'll never have too few things. That's not consistent with scripture, with God, or with history. It's got to be about something bigger and more than that. Can I trust him with the, the real stuff of this world? Yes, but I'm going to learn to trust him on a deeper level than just, okay, God, I signed on to this, so that means you'll give me whatever I need whenever I need it. Yes, he will, but he gets to decide what that is. Kind of gritty, huh? He's inviting us into real relationship with him and to see that he is sovereign, that he is Lord off over all things. So what he allows to take place, we need to prepare, be prepared 
to come to grips with and to live according to his way even in the midst of whatever the circumstances look like because he hasn't stopped caring for you. He hasn't stopped being aware. He isn't inept as a provider. If somehow there's something lacking, either it is, it isn't something we really need, and so we need to question our own heart's perspective. Or there's something I'm getting in the way of. God is providing, and somehow I'm stepping into the mix and doing something with my choices. Okay, I better wrap up there. Here's a suggestion as we respond to Jesus in the, form of, in the form of this truth. Because Jesus is at the center of creation, all that we do is to be done for him and his glory as we live with complete dependence and trust in his faithful provision. He will provide whatever you do whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen? This morning as we go to prayer, I invite you beyond mere words, but with the truthfulness of your heart and soul to commit to and to trust Jesus Christ your Lord, your Savior, the lover of your soul who provides for you. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the challenge that has been here. The beauty that we see in your firm and gentle hand. The compassion that you have the assurance that nothing escapes your awareness and, and your rule, that you are more than able. Lord, I know even in this room that there are those of us going through a wide range of circumstances and experiences, and some of them are ones that we just we don't understand why or where they're coming from. Lord, may our, may our trust be in you, in the tangible things of this life, and in so much more. May we trust that you care for us, our whole being, even our eternal souls, and that you are working for our good, our betterment, our oneness, with you. Thank you, Father. May we submit to you and trust you with our whole selves. In your name, amen. I don't know what you're thankful for this year, but I am thankful for a sovereign God who has the whole world in his hands. You are loved and you are dismissed.